The views expressed in the following video do not represent the views of the DOD, U.S. government, U.S. military, or Sawshek Emergency Medicine Residency. Alright, the case of the week is in regards to a patient that was seen by Dr. Abraham Fish. Dr. Fish was able to see a very interesting case of DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. I imagine that Dr. Fish was probably named after a very important person. Uh, some of y'all know him as the 16th President of the United States, also known as Honest Abe. Did y'all know that Abraham Lincoln did not have a middle name? It's true, I looked it up. Anyways, let's get on with the case of the week. Alright, so diabetic ketoacidosis. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, we got to confirm the diagnosis by one of these three things, right? We need hyperglycemia, greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter, an anion gap acidosis with a pH less than 7.3, and ketosis, all right? Interestingly enough, this patient had the anion gap, right, of 27, the pH of 7.25, and had ketonuria and ketonemia. But when it came to hyperglycemia, the patient only had a blood glucose level of 150 milligrams per deciliter. So this begs the question, is this really DKA? So I did a quick review of the literature, and uh, there is a thing called diabetic euglycemic ketoacidosis. I saw that it was first reported, possibly even earlier, but I saw it reported in the British Medical Journal in 1973 by this guy, uh, Monroe and company. And so he did a, uh, reported on a case series of about 211 episodes of DKA. And he noted that 37 of these episodes were described as euglycemic, meaning they had a blood glucose less than 300. Upon further review, really there was only about 16 of the 211 cases they reported on actually had a blood glucose less than 200. So it's pretty much a rare thing. And what they suggested was the uh, etiology of the relatively low blood glucose was seen in conditions where there's a low caloric intake, precipitated by starvation, and persistent vomiting together with continued use of insulin. So others commented saying that, well, is it really, you know, uh, DKA, maybe these patients were just having really good renal function, clearing all that glucose out, or maybe there was lesser glucose formation. But even today, uh, there's reports of diabetic euglycemic ketoacidosis. So looking in the Journal of General Internal Medicine, all right, back in 2009, there was a uh, case report, and uh, well, the title of this, the case report was Starvation-Induced True Diabetic Euglycemic Ketoacidosis and Severe Depression. Oh. It's pretty long, but basically this was a uh, case report of a 34-year-old who presented with um, you know, suspe suspicion of DKA. He had a pH of 7.3, an anion gap of 29, but his blood glucose was only 105 milligrams per deciliter. So they went on to report and talk about the hospital stay, and they found out this guy was really depressed, severely depressed, and they found that he admitted that he was not eating for about two to three weeks prior to his presentation to the hospital. And so they commented on lots of different causes for euglycemic ketoacidosis listed here. Obviously, uh, depression and uh, starva uh, starvation being one of them. So in summary, uh, regarding euglycemic DKA, although uncommon, uh, it still continues to be observed in clinical practice. You know, patients with type 1 diabetes presenting with nausea and vomiting and are found to have a normal glucose, you know, they still may have a life-threatening ketoacidosis, and assessment of their acid-base status is still indicated, which was exactly done by Dr. Fish. He admitted the patient, and I'm sure the patient is doing fine now. So in such patients where extreme starvation or poor nutritional intake is uh, due to various causes, you know, that may contribute to why these patients are coming in uh, euglycemic. All right? So back to di diabetic ketoacidosis, you know, how do, what do we need to do in the clinical assessment? Well, you need to look at these things, right? You need to look at the signs of their volume depletion in the patient, check out the patient's respiratory function, their mental status, and cardiovascular function. But today we're only going to talk about one thing real quick. Let's talk about respiratory function. And what is very important about this is how do we anticipate whether or not this patient is going to need an airway, you know, need us to basically intubate them for them, all right? So can we predict when a patient's going to go into respiratory failure? Sure we can. 
what do we need? We need an ABG, right? And what is an ABG? We need the pH, or provides the pH, PCO2, O2, and the measured bicarb level. Then we have to go back to our medical school days and remember the Winters formula. Oh, yes. Yeah, this Winters formula, remember, it predicts the expected respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis, right? And remember the formula? All right, expected PAC2 equals 1.5 times the measured bicarb plus 8 plus or minus 2. So let's do some math here, all right? This is the patient's um, ABG. It was 7.25, a PCO2 of 19, and the bicarb was 8.5. So we place that measured bicarb into the Winters formula, and it's going to put out a number, and the number is 21 plus or minus 2. So we just need to know if this number falls within the acceptable range, and it shows that it does, right? 21 plus or minus 2, and the patient's uh, PCO2 was 19. Now, the important part about this is what if that patient's PCO2 was 27, right? Now, this is, a, is higher than what was expected. So this means this patient is holding on to CO2 and is not compensating. So this basically is a failure of compensation, which means that this is a very serious finding, right? Because this means that this is a sign of impending respiratory failure. So you, this patient may need to be intubated in the near future, all right? So moving on. Our ER management, it's really simple with DKA. We gotta do a couple of things, right? We need to give the patient fluids, eventually we have to give them some insulin, and they're gonna need some potassium. And very rarely do we need to give bicarb. So just go to up to date, type in diabetic ketoacidosis, read all about it, and there is an algorithm there that's pretty nice and um, shows you how you should treat a DKA. I would suggest that you go read Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine in September 2009, uh, a couple years back, but uh, they go as an article on uh, DKA and how we manage it, and it gives you this great graph, right? Everything you need to know is right here, how you're going to give your fluids, how you're going to give your insulin, and how you're going to replace potassium, all right? All right, well, that was the case of the week on uh, euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. It's true. It does exist. You can still have DKA with a low blood glucose level. So don't be fooled. And so I hope you enjoyed. Uh, see you next time. This has been a production of EM Talk. I'm Wes Baber. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you next time.